Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Faith Church YouTube channel once again. And we are in the second week of Advent. We've been looking at uh, the book Honest Advent as our guide, and throughout, we're looking at what gifts we can give Jesus this Advent season. Last week, we learned that one of the gifts he wants to give us, or he wants us to give him, is our vulnerability. And I think what we're starting to find is that in this Advent series, the gifts Jesus wants are gifts that he's already given us. Think about how Jesus gave us his vulnerability, for example. He left the perfection of heaven and became human, but not just any human. I mean, God becoming human is vulnerable enough, but he became a baby. I mean, a baby is completely vulnerable in this world, dependent on the care and the provision, the protection of their parents. Well, Jesus went even further than that. When he gave us his vulnerability, he could have chosen to enter the human world in a position of power, such as being born into a really wealthy household, or, or maybe being born into the capital city of the Roman Empire, into the family of the Caesar, where he would have political authority. Instead, he entered our world in the household of lowly peasants. They were part of a people group that had almost no power and influence in the wider world. They were the Jews in first century Palestine. There, in that setting, Jesus existed in obscurity. Now, he lived a perfect life, and then, after three short years of, of ministry, he died a criminal's death. Talk about vulnerability. The all-powerful God became totally vulnerable as a baby. And then that same all-powerful God gave his life and died. And why? Because of love. Love is the next gift that we see God has given us and that we, in turn, give back to him. To understand this love, let's open our Bibles. Now, you might be familiar with the love chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the one that's very famous. It says, love is patient, love is kind, and it goes on and on with this beautiful description of love. But I want us to turn not to the love chapter of the Bible, but what might be called the love book of the Bible, because it focuses so much on how God is love. So turn with me to 1 John. We're actually going to jump around the book of 1 John quite a bit. And actually, I want to start by saying that 1 John is not really properly described as a book. It's actually a letter. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. The writer gives us a brief greeting there when he says, My dear children, I write this to you. Then scan down to verse 7, where he says, Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one. He uses these two greetings um, various times throughout his letter. You're going to see dear children, dear friends often. And whoever this writer is, he seems to be uh, very close to these people. There's a warm relationship. There is children, there is friends, and they're dear. Well, scan ahead now to chapter 2, again, verses 12 through 14. And, and what do you see there? It pops up right again. I write to you, dear children. But then he adds in verse 13, I write to you, fathers. I write to you, young men. I write to you again, dear children. And then verse 14, the fathers and the young men again. Something is missing, though. Not a single name is mentioned, except one. Go back to verse 1 of chapter 2. See the name there? Jesus. Chapter 2, uh, did I say? Chapter 2, verse 1, the name Jesus. The writer mentions that name a lot in this letter, and we're going to see why. But, again, who is this writer? Who are these children, these friends that he is writing to? Well, go through the whole letter, and you'll see he never identifies either himself or them by name. The ancient Christians who, who studied this letter 
uh, in, in the years after it was written, they identified the letter writer as the disciple John, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. Now, we first meet John in Mark chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, which this was at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he calls some fishermen there to follow him. Those fishermen have gone on to become some of the most famous Christian names in history, starting with John and his brother James, but then there was also Peter and Andrew. Now, of those four, Peter, James, and John would eventually become the inner circle, Jesus' three most um, close confidants. And he would spend extra time with them, investing in them and teaching them. Now, furthermore, the ancient historians tell us that it is almost certain that John's mother Mary, or Jesus' mother Mary and John's mother were sisters, making John a first cousin to Jesus. Now, this is not to be confused with another John, John the Baptist, who we also know was a relative of Jesus. Well, there they are. Jesus calls the disciples, including John, to follow them, to follow him, and they go on to have three years together. I'd like you to fast forward then to the end of those three years, to that scene, that famous scene of the upper room where Jesus is having the Last Supper with his disciples on the night he was to be arrested and taken from them. And we learn that the, as they set out the seating arrangement that night, there was a disciple who sat right next to Jesus and actually uh, reclined against him. And that disciple in the Gospel of John is called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, the ancient Christians identified this as the same person. So if all this information is correct, and we don't know it with 100% certainty, though it really seems highly likely, that this disciple is Jesus' best friend. He's the same disciple who wrote the Gospel of John, who read the letters of 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, as well as the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And you put those five together, and this writer, John, has actually written a lot of the New Testament. In fact, the third most in the New Testament. So that John, that close friend of Jesus, is the letter writer. And his New Testament writings are really unique for, for many reasons. And one in particular is that he waited a while to write his letters, we believe. Most of the other books in the New Testament were written um, a couple decades or so after Jesus had ascended back to heaven. But John's books, they're written in more in the vicinity of 60 years after that time. They're, what that means is that John when he wrote, and when he writes this letter of 1 John, is probably an elderly man, kind of like a grandfather in the church. He had watched the church grow and change and face hardships, face threats by the Roman Empire. He had watched as false teachers tried to infiltrate the church. Well, at this point, we believe that John was probably the only one of the 12 disciples left alive. Uh, life expectancy in the first century was m really shorter than what we're used to, about half as much. And so it would have been rare for John to be living as, as old as he was at this point. He might have been in his 80s or 90s even. We don't know for sure. But John had a long life of ministry. Most of his later years in ministry were spent in the city of Ephesus, where there was a, a growing church there. And John wants to drive home a very specific point in this letter. As the last living eyewitness of the amazing love of God that he experienced in Jesus. So turn with me to 1 John, now chapter 1. And we're going to read the first four verses. He says, That which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make 
our joy or to make your joy complete. So he's saying to these Christians, uh, most likely in Ephesus, but knowing that this letter would be copied and sent to all the Christian churches, he's saying, I want you to know that what I'm writing about here to you, uh, what you've heard from the beginning is the truth because I have seen it with my own eyes. I, I've touched it with my hands. It's Jesus. This letter is about Jesus. In particular, it's a letter about the love of God that John saw and felt in Jesus. Now, jump ahead with me to, to still in 1 John to chapter 4, verse 19. And what do we see there? It says, we love because he first loved us. This love that, that John is writing about through his letter, he's saying God initiated this love. God's love flows from who he is. Look at what he, look at what he says in, in verse 7, backing up a, a few verses. He says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Love flows from God. It, it is con entirely consistent with God's core. Love is God's core. All of the other characteristics that God has are like adjectives that help us understand his love. God is holy love. He is gracious love. God is merciful love. God is just love, truthful love, faithful love, and on and on we could go describing his love. God is love, John says in verse 16 there in chapter 4. And so, as we read, that love pours out of God. Now, go back to chapter 3 in verse 1. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. That is what we are. It's amazing to think about this incredible love. God has lavished it on us. Now, keep your finger there in 1 John 3, and I'd like you to turn now to John's gospel. Chapter 1, right at the beginning. John chapter 1, because I think there's a, a really interesting connection that I, that I want us to, to make here. Look at verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Not born of natural descent or of human decision, a husband's will, but born of God. So this idea that, that God has lavished his love on us to the point where we become his children is something that he himself did. God made it possible for us to become his children, John says. For all humans to become his children. How? By receiving him by believing in his name. And how did God do that? Why did God do that? What does it mean to receive him or to believe on his name? Well, go back to 1 John chapter 3 and look at verse 4. I want to see what John has to say because he explains it very well. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Look at verses 4 through 10. I'm going to read them. He says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness but you know that he appeared. And he's talking about Jesus here. He appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who was born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God nor is anyone who does not love his brother. So John tells us that Jesus appeared, that he might take away our sins. That vulnerable baby that we celebrate at Christmas would grow up to be a man who would continue to make himself vulnerable 
and die. And why? So that he could take away our sins. Now, also, look at how John describes it in verse 8. Jesus also appeared to destroy the work of the devil. Oftentimes, especially during communion, but many other times you might hear me describe Jesus' death and resurrection like this, that through his death and resurrection, Jesus defeated sin, death, and the devil. And we know that from passages just like this one in 1 John 3. Jesus was victorious over sin, over death, and the devil. Now, there are many ways that the writers of the New Testament describe what happened when Jesus was born, lived that perfect life, which, by the way, thinking about Jesus' perfect life, you can see there in verse 5 and verse 7 that in him is no sin, and he was righteous. So he lived this perfect life. He then died on the cross and rose from the grave to new life. The New Testament writers describe what happened or the significance of that in many different ways. We call that whole process the atonement. One of the descriptions talks about how Jesus was our substitute. Another one says he was our ransom. And there are other ways to describe it as well. I love this one here in John, that Jesus was victorious over sin, over death, over the devil. Why? Because it reminds us that Jesus is infinitely more powerful than sin and death and the devil. And it reminds us that God is a God of love. Look at 1 John 3, verse 16. 1 John 3, verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We're going to continue with 1 John 3, 16 in just a moment. But I need to point out something that is so interesting that happened long, long ago, when the people who were editing the Bible and and compiling the Bible put chapters and verses together. Now, we don't know who added them specifically or when, you know, but the writers of the New Testament did not actually write in chapter and verse. They just wrote. In fact, the, the most ancient manuscripts, if you look at them across the page, it's just capital letters packed in. They were conserving space because writing materials were extremely expensive. You can look it up on Google. Just Google uh, New Testament manuscripts, and you'll see what I mean. So all the spacing, even separating words from other words, all the formatting, the punctuation, of course, the chapter numbers, the verse numbers were all added much later. And something wild happened. Look again at 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Now, keep your finger there at 1 John 3.16 and turn back now to the Gospel of John and look at John uh, chapter 3. John chapter 3 and go to verse 16. And what do we read there? You might be familiar with this. It is considered to be the most famous verse in the Bible. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Notice how they're almost identical. 1 John 3, 16 and John 3, 16. It's not really surprising, I guess, in the sense that they were written by the same guy. But I wonder if the people who were adding those chapters and verses noticed this or tried this on purpose. Well, it's a little fact of trivia, and it might just be a coincidence, but coincidence or not, the far more important point that we see in these two verses is that the message is a God of love. A God who initiated this love for us. And he clearly demonstrates his love through the gift of Jesus. That's really why we make such a big deal about Christmas and Easter. They're like love-filled bookends of the life of Jesus. Now, of course, God's love was clearly evident before Jesus came on the scene. And it remains clearly evident even to this day after Jesus But the message that John wants us to hear, and he wants us to know this, is that God's love 
is freely given, flowing from him. Love comes to us without earning it. So to be a Christian, we read, is that we have to receive that gift of love. We don't earn it. It is truly a gift. So how do we actually receive this gift? John wants us to have no mistaking or no uncertainty about what he means. In fact, in the letter, he repeats himself numerous times. So let's look at how John describes what it means for us to receive the gift of God's love in Jesus. Now, go back to 1 John 3.16, and we're going to continue. He says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. You see that? We receive God's gift of love by doing what Jesus did. Now, first of all, we know that God loves us because Jesus laid down his life for us. And likewise, we will show that God's love is alive and at work in us when we lay down our lives as well. Now, notice how John goes on to describe this act of laying down our lives. Look at verses 17 through 20. He says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This, then, is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Now, what we see is that we can know that we belong to the truth. We can know it, that, that we are actually children of God. Now, I appreciate what he's saying here because sometimes really people start to wonder, am I a child of God or not? Am I truly a Christian or not? And maybe you've had one of those moments when you've wondered the same thing. I was recently talking with someone about their own spiritual journey, and they said that they, they grew up in a Christian family. Uh, all they ever knew was Christianity and church and following Jesus. And so they don't remember ever having that moment of decision when they decided to become a Christian. And that's perfectly normal for many people. Being a follower of Jesus is just what they've always been, even from an early young child. But then something happens. The years go by. They start to question. Maybe, maybe God seems distant, and they wonder to themselves, shouldn't a true Christian feel closer to God? Or maybe they've allowed some bad habits in their lives and they haven't done much to grow a close relationship with Jesus in recent months or years and they start to wonder, am I really a Christian? It's kind of what John describes there in verses 19 and 20. Hearts and minds that are not at rest. He uses the word, they condemn us. The person that I was talking to said that when they were in their teenage years and they really were wrestling with this, they would go to a youth retreat or some kind of a church event where people would ask that question, are you really sure that you're a Christian? They would wonder. They would start to doubt. And so they would kind of quietly to themselves pray really quick, okay, God, I'm, I'm just making sure here. I want you to know. I really mean it this time. I, I believe in you. I am a Christian. But John says we can set our hearts at rest in God's presence, because God is greater than our hearts. That's just another way of John saying, basically, our emotions don't always tell us the truth. Just because you don't feel close to God or you're doubting whether or not you're really a true child of God, it doesn't mean that you're not. I'd like to suggest that John gives us a far better way to evaluate whether we are truly a child of God. John's is a non-emotional way. He says, examine how you love. Now, I'm, I'm going to be working backwards through the passage here, and I, I want us to first look at, at verse 18, where he says, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. What he's describing there is true love flowing from us. Now, I appreciate John is making a very clear distinction here about what this love looks like in real life. It's not just 
epithets or, or, or statements of what we believe. It's actions. We show, in other words, that God's love is flowing through us by the actions of our lives. It's exactly how we see God's love in action, right? God didn't just stay up there in, in heaven in perfection and, and say, hey, people, I just love you, and then leave us stranded in our sins and never interact with us. He did something about it. He embodied love through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. His love was a body broken and blood poured out for us. Which is what we symbolize and we remember every month when we celebrate communion together in worship. Communion is essentially a reenactment of the symbols that point to God's love. But we also reenact God's love, and I think even more importantly, in the choices of our lives, in our actions. Our actions, John is saying, show whether or not we have God's love in us. He goes on to illustrate this because he wants to make sure there is no doubt that we understand the kind of love he's talking about. So now we go backwards again to verse 17. He says, that in verse 17, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Now, we may never have to actually give our lives to the point of uh, death, just like Jesus did on the cross. Uh, of course, some may have to do that, and over the course of history, some Christians have had to do that, but many of us won't what we will all have is the opportunity to be generous to those in need. I'd like us to dwell for a moment on that verse 17. Last week, I mentioned that Christmas, as commonly practiced by Christians, can kind of be strange because it's Jesus' birthday, right? That means Christmas is Jesus' birthday party. But instead of giving him gifts like you would at a normal birthday party, we give each other gifts, or sometimes we just give ourselves gifts. So what John writes here is that we can give Jesus the gift of our love by blessing other people with gifts. Christmas is as good a time as any to do that, right? It's not wrong to give gifts to people especially if it's done in Jesus' honor at Christmas time. All the children who might be listening to this are thinking, oh, good, thanks, Pastor Joel, uh, because last week you kind of had me nervous there saying that at Christmas we should be focused on giving gifts to other people or giving gifts to Jesus. Well, take a closer look at verse 17. You might start getting nervous again. Who are the people that John is talking about here? What he says is, there's one person who has material possessions, and then there's another person who is in need. Now, as Christians, at Christmas time, we tend to identify with that person in need. We want to receive gifts. In fact, our culture wants all of us to identify with that person in need. But the reality is that John is calling us to identify with the person who has the material possessions. He makes it a test case for how we can evaluate if God's love is resident and alive in us. Now, even if you are a younger person listening to this and you're dependent on your parents to provide for you, even if you are an older person listening to this, you're trying to make ends meet on a fixed income, even if you're a person listening to this who's working like crazy, trying to pay the bills and wondering how you're going to make it through Christmas with all the normal extra expense of Christmas, John wants all of us to identify with the person who has the material possessions. And what does he say about that person? He says we should be on the lookout for people in need, and we should give of our possessions to help that person. That's what the gift of love looks like at Christmas. So when you think about Christmas, rather than thinking about the gifts that you want to receive, we should be thinking about who are the people in need and how we can give them gifts. Now, how many of you have already put up your Christmas trees? We did uh, a couple of weeks ago. 
As a kid, I remember looking at that space underneath the Christmas tree after the tree went up and that space was big and wide and open and empty. And I was excitedly thinking about how that space over the coming weeks would soon get filled up with gifts for me and my siblings. A pile of gifts wrapped beautiful is such a part of our cultural identity at Christmas, isn't it? But what John is telling us here is that we should perhaps think less about filling up the space under our Christmas trees, and instead we should be thinking about how our homes and our closets and our attics and our garages and our rental storage spaces are already full. Uh, we have some missionaries from Faith Church, Lamar and Janice Stolzfus, who are home for a short trip to take care of some um, medical appointments and visit with family over the holidays. And they were mentioning to me the other day that one of their goals on this short trip is to go over to their storage unit that they have since they live in Africa, hoping to downsize. Because they said they have so much stuff in that storage unit that they haven't touched in the nine or ten years that they've been missionaries. They want to downsize. How many of us could say the same thing? Many of us have loads of stuff that we rarely touch. How could we use those possessions to bless people in need, whether by just straight out giving it to those who need it or selling it to make extra funds available for people in need? Christmas so often is an exercise in the rich blessing the rich with more riches. And yeah, kids, I'm sorry, but I'm talking about you. Really, though? I'm talking about all the people here. Adults, kids, young, old. The likelihood is that you don't need the vast majority of the gifts that you'll receive for Christmas. And really, for most of us, all throughout the year, if a need pops up or, and we need something, we just go out and get it. The gift of love, John says, is when we open our eyes, uh, we listen with our ears, and, and really it's, it's a posture of our heart to see, to hear, to be aware of those in need and bless them. Again, it is not wrong to bless our kids and our family and our friends with gifts at Christmas and birthdays and anniversaries. But the real heart of God's love in Christmas is God reaching out to people in need, to those who cannot help themselves. That was to us. And so we show that God's love is alive and working through us when we give the gift of love back to Jesus, when we give selfishly and selflessly and sacrificially to those in need. I really saw this heart of sacrificial love so clearly when Faith Church, back in the spring, decided to loan ourselves $10,000 from our building fund into our care and share fund, thus making money available that we were going to spend on ourselves, essentially, available for people in need. It was amazing, because to date, we have given over $8,000 of that money away. Some of those gifts, in fact, were matching gifts, and, and, and some of the gifts, we invited the ministerium to join us in giving, and that means more than $10,000 has already been given, closer to twelve. I praise God for that kind of generosity. So I want to ask, how can that selfless love continue? And I ask that question to all of us. What it requires is to choose to have a different mindset about Christmas. Moving your heart from a focus on what you will get at Christmas to what you will lovingly give for Christmas. Who are the people in need in your life? Who are the people that don't already have abundance and who really have needs? I would suggest this is one reason why Conestoga Valley Christian Community Services is, is an organization that remains so important for us to support. CVCCS provides food and clothing to those in need. They have other programs as well. They're, they're a mentoring program for uh, local children. They're a financial aid program for people in, that need help with finances. And then they have special donations at holidays. 
It's also why we support, over the years, an organization like Church World Service, which assists people from all over the world moving to Lancaster as they flee persecution from their own country. What we see as we reach out to people in need is that love is participatory. Love is not just participatory in helping those in need, but love is also selfless and sacrificial to those within a church family. John repeats this over and over again. We already heard it once when I, when I read earlier in chapter 3 that anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Now, look at chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. He says this, Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him, in Jesus, in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. So he's talking about an old command that's also a new command, and that's kind of confusing. What's he mean? Well, he's re referring to something he mentioned in his gospel. So keep your finger in 1 John and turn to John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. This is the scene of the upper room, the place where Jesus had that final meal with his disciples on the night he was arrested. During the meal, Jesus taught them. You can scan through John chapters 13 through 17 and see all the teaching from Jesus. There's loads of it. Well, in verses 34 and 35, he gives them a particular command. It is this, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. In other words, we should be a church family that is known for loving one another. Even when we think differently about things, we still love one another. Even if we disagree about how to handle political situations or the cultural situations like the pandemic, we still love one another. Even if someone in our church family just rubs us the wrong way, we still love one another. Now, we can really easily fall into the fallacy of believing that other people are just too difficult to love. And we think to ourselves, why can't they be more like me? Why can't everyone just act like me or think like me? Then life will be great. Well, I think we can especially get caught in that kind of thinking trap as it relates to our spouses. But maybe if everyone, including our spouses, was just like us and thought just like us, it wouldn't be so great. Michelle and I have been watching the new season of The Crown on Netflix. It's a show about the monarchy in England, especially uh, Queen Elizabeth, who's still alive. Um, and the more I watch that show, the more I think it should be called The Marriage. It so often talks about the marriages, and especially the Queen's marriage, but also Charles and Diana's. One of the enduring lessons on the show is the need to learn to love and respect one another's differences with the clear self-knowledge that we ourselves are not perfect. And so we sacrifice ourselves in love for our spouse, for this person who can upset us and disappoint us and frustrate us. Because through it all, we learn that a husband and a wife are two people who in their common brokenness, are loved by God and can love one another. As we love our spouses sacrificially and think about what God did for us, he sacrificially gave Jesus for us when we were far from perfect. So we too can give our lives in love to the people around us who are far from perfect. We can give ourselves to serve them and to love them, to treat them with respect and kindness. That doesn't mean that in a church family we're going to be best friends with everyone. It's simply not possible in most churches, including a church, faith church's size. So we need to have a, a sense of graciousness and, and be okay with the fact that some people are just closer 
than others. I've heard it said that there are cliques in churches. It's been said about our church too. But the reality is it's natural for people to segment off in smaller groups or of friends, whether it's a care group or a Sunday school class or just people who enjoy one another's company. That's okay as long as we are loving in the process, as long as we keep an eye out for those who are on the outskirts or not included, and we welcome them in love. So what will it look like for you to live with that kind of love this Christmas? Do you need to have a heart check to see if you need to be more loving? One of the greatest gifts that you can give Jesus this Christmas is to receive his love, become his child, and then once you are his child, whether you just become his child today or maybe you've been in his family for years, you then love him back. And you love him back by loving one another. And you love those who are in need. Our love for other people should be impossible to miss because it's so active. That's one of the greatest gifts that you can give Jesus this Christmas. Lord, we thank you for the love that you first showed to us through the amazing gift of Jesus. His life, his death, his resurrection. Help us, Lord, to reflect that love, to be filled with your love, and to let your love flow from us to our church family, to our biological family, to our friends, especially to those in need. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to have that kind of divine love in us and through us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We would love to connect with you further. All you have to do is go to our website, findfaithhere.org. Uh, you can learn about Faith Church. You can learn more about Honest Advent and uh, contact us. We'd be glad to talk further. Thank you.